Mexico's indigenous population has suffered displacement, discrimination and the destruction of their lands, while the political class has turned a blind eye. In a bid to change this, indigenous groups have elected Maria de Jesus Patricio Martinez, a 53-year-old traditional healer from Jalisco State, to represent them in next year's elections. Viva Mexico! Viva. My name is Stephen Woodman. And I'm Duncan Tucker. You're listening to Viva Mexico, a podcast from Guadalajara offering news and views in the age of Trump. This week, we'll be talking to Patricio about her historic campaign, and we'll be speaking to Adrian Lopez, the editor of a newspaper in Sinaloa, about the relentless wave of attacks on Mexican journalists. Patricio was nominated last month to represent the National Indigenous Congress and the Zapatista National Liberation Army, a group of Mayan rebels who led an armed uprising in southern Mexico in 1994. I went to her hometown of Tuxpan to ask what she hopes to achieve through this campaign. Women are rarely taken into account here, and it is even worse from those from indigenous communities. We are marginalized and forgotten for being women, for being indigenous, and for being poor. Our aim is to visualize the problems we face and put them into the national agenda. We also want to organize all of those at the bottom, all the indigenous peoples, together with civil society. We cannot stand the government's capitalist program of debt and destruction any longer. We need to pull out the roots of what is hurting us and put something new in its place, something that comes from those at the bottom. Mm. The Zapatistas had previously stayed out of electoral politics, so when they announced that they were fielding a candidate, Mexico's leftist frontrunner, Andres Manuel López Obrador, accused them of hypocrisy. The concern for López Obrador was that their candidate could split the leftist vote and harm his chances of winning the election. I asked Patricio whether she saw him as a rival. We are not looking for votes. We are working to organize ourselves. If we were going for votes, then we will fight with him. But we are looking beyond the election. We do not want to be another force in this rotten system. We want to use these tools against them in our own way. The elections are just a circus they put on, but they never take the people at the bottom into account. We will construct a world where everyone fits, where the people give orders and the government obeys. So Steve, what did you make of that that tweet last year from from López Obrador uh, criticising the Zapatistas for for running a candidate? Uh, Well, I don't think it's a good idea for left-wing candidates to criticise grassroots indigenous movements, definitely. She says her campaign is primarily symbolic and I think she might actually end up with votes, more votes than expected. 20% of the population in Mexico identify as indigenous and this is very much anecdotal evidence but I already know four people who said that they want to vote for her. But it is a protest vote so it's likely that plenty of people who vote for her are actually people that would never vote for López Obrador in the first place. They're people who feel completely disenchanted with the current state of Mexican politics. So I think López Obrador is making a mistake to criticise her publicly in this way about splitting the vote, don't you think? Yeah, and I think they're actually quite different as well. Like, does López Obrador is quite a conservative, actual, in, his, in some of his policies and, and uh, as a person, whereas the, this indigenous campaign is a very anti-capitalist feminist campaign and there's no other party or candidate in Mexico that really represents um, anti-capitalism or feminism really so I don't think that they're really covering the same basis. So Steve last week we spoke to the British political analyst Owen Jones about whether there's anything that Lopez Obrador could take from uh, Jeremy Corbyn the British Labour Party leader who they've both met they've got a fairly close relationship. Um, Obviously Corbyn had a unexpected success in the British general election last week. He, I think it was the biggest um, swing in votes from one Labour election to another since 1945 or something like that. So although he didn't win outright, it was uh, he did a lot better than expected. Is there anything that López Obrador could take from this kind of unexpected success? Yes, I think so. I think one reason Labour had success was they produced a manifesto with clear popular proposals that were costed And I think López Obrador would do well to be clear about his aims. He's sometimes very vague, Mm -hmm. speaking about the ways he's going to tackle Mexico's many problems. 
I think he should also be clear about his political past, the fact that he was a pretty successful mayor or very successful mayor of Mexico City. He needs to reassure the electorate that he isn't aspiring to establish a dictatorship in Mexico. And he needs to be clear on why he's different from Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro, because even though that may seem slightly ridiculous, many people are genuinely worried that he has exactly the same aims for Mexico. Yeah, I think that is going to be the, one of the key issues that he's got to overcome because it, more and more in the Mexican press we hear the, the, the PRI and the government talking about Venezuela and they, they keep criticising the Venezuelan government. And they, they don't, I don't think they care about what happens in Venezuela. They're using it as a way to subtly attack López Obrador because the implication is that all this chaos that we're seeing in Venezuela is what's, what we're going to see in Mexico if, if López Obrador wins. So he really needs an effective way of uh, combating those, those attacks, doesn't he? Yeah, and speaking about that tweet, it's tweets like that, I think, that really let him down and let his campaign down because he's at risk often of coming across as if he feels he's got a divine right to the presidency. Um, I can't imagine Jeremy Corbyn publicly criticising a minority group in the UK who wanted to run a candidate. Hillary Clinton had the same problem when she ran for the US presidency and Jeb Bush had the same problem when he ran to be Republican candidate. You need to be clear that you're trying to win the presidency rather than you feel you've got some kind of right. You've got to earn it. Yeah, you've got to earn it, exactly. Yeah. So we saw in the midterm elections in the state of Mexico last week that López Obrador's candidate narrowly lost out to the PRI, and that was largely because the leftist vote was split between his party Morena and the leftist PRD. Um, he said this week that he, he won't uh, go into any alliance or coalition with the PRD next year, only with the Workers' Party, which is a much smaller leftist group. Do you think it makes sense for him to rule out uh, a coalition with, with another leftist party when if, he had, if they had been united in the state of Mexico, they would have won? And they could, the same thing could happen next year in a presidential election. Yeah, well, I think it would be good to reassure undecided voters that he has a capacity to work with others if he was able to form an alliance with his old party, which is the the PID. It's worth mentioning as well, of course, that there were certain irregularities in the election. Yeah. So what kind of ideas does Patricio, the indigenous candidate, offer for Mexico? Well, as, as you said, they're not really going to win votes. Like the, the main purpose of her campaign is, and it, she doesn't see it as her campaign, she's just a kind of spokesperson for the indigenous communities. But the, the, ma the main aim is to build a nationwide network of activists and create links between the indigenous communities with working class Mexicans, um, urban Mexicans, and build this entire network, which their, their end game is to, to actually kind of bring down the entire Mexican political system. They want to use this tool of electoral politics against the Mexican government and use it to, to build a big enough base of support that they can then basically kind of destroy the system and, and build a kind of grassroots kind of self-governing system afterwards. I mean, obviously, that's a pretty ambitious thing to be doing. But I think I, I think they could have some success in, in creating a bigger kind of more nationwide uh, network of support. So it sounds like she's got very radical revolutionary ideas yeah, I think that comes straight from the the Zapatistas. They've always been a very radical group, and um, they, they they've never sought to take power as in like replace the government at the top of the system. That they've always been in favour of each kind of community governing it, itself, and I think that's part of what she she hopes to achieve on a national scale. Moving on to another issue that's dominated the news in Mexico in recent weeks, we want to address the shocking level of violence against Mexican journalists. Last month, Javier Valdez, the editor of the Rio Doce newspaper in Sinaloa, was shot dead outside its offices in Culiacán. Valdez wrote a lot about the drug trade, and he may have been the victim of a violent turf war between different factions of the Sinaloa cartel. He was the most high-profile journalist to be killed in Mexico in recent years, and he was well-known and respected by many foreign correspondents. We asked Adrian Lopez, the editor of Noroeste, another newspaper in Sinaloa, about how the local community has uh, reacted to Valdez's death. What we saw is uh, a lot of indignation, a lot of anger and a lot of fear after the assassination of Javier, especially in, into the journalists and also uh, social uh, activists and, and social leaders, because killing a character like Javier, not only the person, uh, killing the journalist, uh, maybe the the most famous journalist of Sinaloa 
for me and maybe for all of these people who have been critics and are trying to say the truth about what's happening with violence, crime and corruption in Sinaloa, uh, uh, we think it's a strong message. It's a strong message to the society. It is a strong message about we, if we can kill Javier, we can kill anybody. Javier Valdez became the sixth Mexican journalist murdered this year and over 100 journalists have been murdered in Mexico since the year 2000. One of the biggest hurdles to overcome is the level of impunity in these cases. Of all the acts of aggression against journalists in Mexico, more than 99% go unpunished. So Duncan, you interviewed Javier Valdez earlier this year. What did he tell you about the dangers that he and other journalists were facing? Yes, yeah, so I first met Valdez in, uh, in Culiacan last year, went for a coffee, and he was very like frank and insightful and generous with his time. He was a kind of local point of contact for any foreign journalist who would go to Sinaloa to report on the drug war. And I interviewed him again in January, and we spoke specifically about the dangers that Mexican journalists face. Um, he actually told me at the time that he thought it would be safer for him and his family to leave the country. But I got I got the impression that he kind of felt it was his duty to stay there and, and report on this stuff, because if he didn't, then, then who would? One of the interesting things that he mentioned, and this is kind of a, a misconception, I think, about the, the violence against journalists in Mexico, is that many people assume that the, the narcos, the drug traffickers, are behind all of the attacks on, on Mexican journalists. And Valdez actually told me that he thought it would be more dangerous to investigate political corruption in Mexico than it is to investigate organised crime. And um, the Press Freedom Watchdog Article 19 actually found that public officials were responsible for more than half of all acts of aggression against Mexican journalists last year. One thing I get asked all the time is, as a journalist here is people always ask how dangerous it is to be here. And I think there's an important distinction to make between what it's like being a foreign journalist living here and what it's like for Mexican journalists. I think there's a kind of uh, acknowledgement among the people committing these crimes that or an awareness that, that if they kill a foreign journalist, then there's going to be a degree of, of pressure from foreign governments. There's going to be more... The, the Mexican government's going to feel compelled to actually do something about it and arrest people, whereas they, they know that they can basically kill Mexican journalists with complete uh, impunity which is why the Mexican journalists are under a lot more um, danger. The other thing I think as well is that um, there's a kind of split between those who work in dangerous rural areas and those who work in big cities. I think if you come from somewhere like Guadalajara or from Mexico City and you go to Sinaloa or Tamaulipas or Veracruz for a couple of days and do a story and then you go back to the city again and you're kind of removed from the consequences. But if you live in somewhere like Sinaloa, like, like Valdez, then you have to, to deal with the consequences of what you write every single day. As Lopez runs his own newspaper in Sinaloa, we asked him what could be done to better protect journalists in Mexico. Mexico is one of the most dangerous countries in the world to do journalism. Uh, what we are trying to do in Noroeste, and I think in, in, in the rest of the media in Sinaloa, is how to protect better our journalists, how to design better protocols, how to employ more uh, systems and processes uh, to take care about our journalism. We also uh, have a psychiatric and psychology assistance in a permanent way to our newsroom because we know that the violence we are covering day by day is not normal. So we need uh, professional assistance and we need professional help in order to understand and talk more about this uh, kind of phenomena and the traumas that the violence could cause in our persons. So Steve, I thought it was interesting what he said about uh, psychological assistance for journalists. That's not something that we hear about very often. Do you think that it's kind of overlooked, this, this aspect of their work, given the amount of traumatic situations that Mexican journalists are exposed to? Do you think they need more, more support in, in this kind of thing? Yeah, definitely. Mexican journalists face a wide range of psychological threats from seeing mutilated dead bodies to receiving death threats from cartels and politicians. So they are often in need of some more psychological support. Yeah, I think it's good that he's, he's thinking about bringing this in and hopefully that could even become a kind of standard for, for newspapers all across the country. Earlier this week, the Attorney General's Office announced that it's offering rewards of up to 1.5 million pesos 
or about $83,000 for information leading to the arrest of those responsible for killing journalists. Do you think that's a good idea, Duncan? Well, I think on the one hand, this suggests that they're taking this seriously because these kinds of rewards are normally only offered for information on major drug lords. But on the other hand, one of our fellow reporters, Jan Albert Hutzen, who works for the Committee to Protect Journalists in Mexico, he was saying the other day that the, the fact that they've resorted to offering awards doesn't exactly inspire you with confidence that the Mexican investigators are capable of actually capturing and prosecuting those responsible by themselves. So Steve, before we end this episode, what's been going on with Donald Trump lately? Has he been too busy to antagonise Mexico? Well, he's been pretty busy with constant talk about his Russian ties, pulling out of the Paris Accords. There's really been an exhausting stream of news that we haven't got time to go into. The NAFTA renegotiations are coming up sometime this year. They could be as early as mid-August. So people in business in Mexico particularly are waiting to see what happens. The US has moderated its tone a bit recently, the US administration. I think there's a growing awareness that Mexico is a very important trade partner, especially if, for example, you're a farmer in the Corn Belt. In some ways, Mexico has already served its symbolic purpose and played an important part in his election campaign. So Trump is actually in a bit of a bind going into the NAFTA renegotiations. He needs to show people that voted for him that he's going to revive manufacturing in the US. And at the same time, he can't risk getting into a trade war either. But overall, it's been a lot quieter, don't you think? Yeah, I think Mexico kind of, it, it benefits from the, the more domestic problems that Trump gets involved in, the less time he's got to to, to use Mexico as his um, scapegoat for whatever Americans' problems, problems are. And it, it buys Mexico a bit more time. I think the, the longer this goes on, the, they're going to have a slightly stronger hand going into these negotiations, or they can just try and wait it out even in the, in the hope that Trump won't end up serving his, his full term. Viva Mexico! You've been listening to Viva Mexico, a podcast from Guadalajara on Mexico in the age of Trump. If you enjoyed this episode, you can subscribe to our channels on YouTube, SoundCloud and iTunes. And if you have any comments or questions, you can message us on Twitter at Viva Mex Podcast. Party.